of our family of Jeremiah. Yeah. Yeah. What a blessing from God, amen. 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 Going right into the ministry. What a blessing. It's just a blessing to see each and every one of us. We need each other, amen. 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 The Bible says we're going to heaven. If we believe in Jesus, heaven is our home, and that's promised to us. The promised land. No more sorrow, no more tears, no more pain. A place of continuous joy and freedom in Christ. Amen? Amen. No more sin nature. Amen. It's coming. Heaven is our home. When we go home to be with the Lord, we're going to be free from the presence of sin. The lion and the lamb are going to be able to lay together, the baby and the lion, everything. It's just going to be awesome. Amen? Amen. But we're not there yet. <laughs> If you're not noticed, we are living in a land full of deception and deceit and full of Satan. The tempter and wants to take us out of that promised land. <coughs> but one thing he can't do, he can't take us out of heaven. Amen? Amen. Amen. But God promised us not only a literal promised land when we go home to be with him, but a spiritual promised land of joy and rest and peace in the Lord now. Amen? And there's a lot of things that hinder us, and many Christians don't get to that land of rest in there while they're alive here, down here on earth, because they don't really understand why God saved them, and for what reason he saved us. To build his kingdom down here, and to glorify him, and to what? Use it against the powers of darkness. Yep. Amen? Amen? The Israelites, the promised land was a physical place. A land flowing with milk and honey. Remember they went, they went and scouted the land out? They brought back some grapes so heavy it took two people to carry it. There was this abundance. Now, what's the promised land today? It's a spiritual state of mind. No matter what's going on in your life, God is with us. There should be peace and, and joy in all the storms in life while we're down here. But obviously we've got some enemies trying to take us out of that promised land down here. Yeah. Amen? Just like they did. The one caught up in their sin nature, okay? Or some other life, life dominating sin, such a place may seem like a mirage, okay? Or perhaps even a delusion. But because of the work Jesus did for us on the cross, okay? The same spiritual place is promised to us and is available to us today. Amen? Amen. Amen? We're all familiar with the biblical account. Let's go to Exodus 3. Let's read this account. We're going to go into this again. They were about to enter a, a land full of flowing with milk and honey, but it had many enemies in that land that they had to overtake in order to get to that promised land. And we today have a lot of enemies to overcome to get to that spiritual promised land today. It's called the flesh. It keeps us out of that spiritual place. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. Thank God for his grace and his mercy. And thank God it's not conditional how we're going to be. We're going to be walking and ruling and reigning with the Lord. Amen. That's not conditional. The penalty of sin has been paid for at the cross. That's a one-time event. You can't improve on it or lose it. Thank God. But freedom from the power of sin is an ongoing battle. And we all struggle with this while we're here. Amen? As long as we're in this sinful body, it can't enter the kingdom of God. But God promised us that we can be stable in everything that's going on around us and still have that. We can have some of that heaven now. How many of us want a peace in their lives? Amen. 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 You know, you go out there in the world, everything's stressful, right? Finances, making a living, church, family, everything, bills. And we get all frustrated all the time. We think we've got to handle these things in the flesh. But God says, no, you have to learn how to trust me. Amen. And I will give uh, to seek ye first the kingdom above everything else. Then all these things will be added unto you. Amen. Most people try to fix everything first and then try to seek the kingdom. We cannot, we cannot seek, the, you can't get to the kingdom in the flesh. Amen? All right, so look at Exodus chapter 3, look at verse 7. And this like he said to them, 
in verse 7. Then the Lord told him. And by the way, we are using the New Living Translation. If anybody wants to use one, there is one back there. That's what we are using. Okay. I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. How can I bring that down today? God sees the oppression we go through while we're here. Okay? God sees, God knows everything we're going through. Okay? I heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I'm aware of their suffering. And so I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt to their own fertile and spacious land. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Right? Listen, that's what he wants to lead. He's delivering us from that now. What? That state of mind, that sin nature, keeps us out of that promised land of peace. No matter what's going on in your life, Remember Jesus was sleeping in the boat when the wind and the waves and the storms were coming and saying, what's wrong with you? Well, we're going to drown. What are, you, what are you doing? He's saying, you have little faith. Look, the storms are like, Peter walked out on the water. Jesus said, come to me. Come. Right? What did he do? He came to Jesus. He started looking. Then he started seeing what? The wind and the waves. He's seen all the problems in life. And he started to what? Sink. Help me, Lord. This is what happens in our spiritual life as Christians. We have to understand that. But there's giants in the land, he said. Look what it says. I have come down to rescue, verse 8, from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites now live. What would that mean spiritually? That would be the obstacles in our lives today, okay? Inward and outward that stop us from entering that place of rest and promise that Jesus died to give us now. Amen? Okay, and amen for that. So we know we're going to heaven that's already been taken care of. Now it's time to what? Deal with what's going on in our lives today, okay? That's a one-time event. You can't improve on it. Once it's done, it's a done deal. Now what do we do? Now we find out why God saved us and what he would want us to do down here on earth. What is our purpose here? Amen? Our purpose is, look, you know what, you know what the problem is? We're the problem. He comes to free us from ourselves. The bondage of sin. The power of sin that still controls us at times. Amen? All right, I want us to go to Romans 7. And this is, the, I'm just trying to lock in the struggle that we all go through, okay? Just so you know, you're not in this battle alone, okay? Yeah. I'm in the battle. And we're all in this battle together. When one part suffers, all the parts suffer. God calls us to love one another. 1 Corinthians 13, it's unconditional. No matter what's going on, we gather here and we love each other. Amen? Amen. And we don't keep any records of being wrong. Amen. We're always hopeful. We never give up. Now look what it says in verse 15. Apostle Paul said, I, really, I, I don't really understand myself. Think about this now. For I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. Now, you have to understand the context of this. He's not talking about him doing something that he likes to do. His sin nature, he learned he hated his sin nature. Even though he still felt prey to it, he didn't like it. He hated to do the things that he did. It's a difference from when you're living in sin and when you're delivered from it and you don't want it anymore and you still continue in it and still wanting it. Amen? It's a whole different ball game here. Look. I want to do what's right, but I don't. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know that what I'm doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good, or the word of God. So I am not the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. So he's telling us that the problem is not people in the world or the situations outside. It's our sin nature. He's telling us what the problem is. Look what it says. I, it is sin living in me that does it. So what do we have living in us? Sin. It's in our DNA. We adapt. We got it from Adam. We all have it. 
That's why when we compare ourselves, to, this is, we're going to get into this. We shouldn't compare ourselves to each other because you who do say these things do the very same thing. When we judge other people, we're only talking about ourselves. Now look what it says. Look at verse 18. Now this is the Apostle Paul saying this. I know nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. Okay? Look what it says. I want to do what is right, but I don't. I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. Does anybody get wrapped up in this? Can anybody, can I get an amen for that? Amen. amen. We're in a hospital for healing. We're sick. That's why we need a savior. We cannot save ourselves from this. Amen. We cannot overcome the flesh in the flesh. Amen. We can't. It's a constant battle. Look at what it says. I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. Sort of like we're possessed by it. I have discovered this principle of life. That when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law or God's word with all my heart. But there's another power within me that is at war with my mind. The battle is up here. It is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. And look what it says that happens in verse 24. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Now, you wonder? Should there be any Christians that are miserable? No. Nope. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Why is he miserable? Because it's sin still controlling him. Look at it says. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So Jesus is the answer. There is no other solution. You can't go in the world to get fixed from this problem. There's only one solution, Jesus. They can only fix us, free us from what? Ourselves. Which is the problem to begin with. Once you can realize that I'm the problem, Jesus Christ is the solution, it's a miracle. Huh? Sin is the problem, Jesus is the uh, solution, and the result is a miracle. What? A transformed human being into the image of Jesus Christ. Nothing that I can do is what he did. And guess what? He's never going to give up on us. If you fail today, it's okay. I failed today. Don't word indeed. I, I'm not, I know there's something I did that didn't line up with God. I already know. I might not even realize it. How about you? Thank you. I'm not the only one going through this, I guess, huh? Because... I come to church because I'm falling apart, not because I have it together. Amen. And I'm not going to stand up here and put a church face on and tell you everything's perfect. There's only one thing that's perfect, my relationship with Jesus. Amen. That can't be taken away from me no matter what I think or what I do. Thank God it can't be taken away from me. Now, can I continue in sin if I choose to? Yes. Well, that, you listen, your sin, don't, your sin nature doesn't hurt God, by the way. Your sins don't hurt God, they hurt you. Amen. And they hurt other people. That's why God hates sin so much. Amen. God's not mad at you when you sin. He's mad at sin itself because it's defeating and self-destructive. Can I get an amen for that? How many of us still beat ourselves up over our sins? And we what? Lose our relationship with God. It takes us away from Him. Because you know, there's no way I could live up to that standard, so I'm not even going to bother going to church. No, God said come to church because that's the solution. <laughs> Look what it says. This is the solution, Jesus. Look what it says. The answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see how it is, he's saying. Look how simple he put it. In my mind, I really want to obey God. Right? God's law. But because my sinful nature, I'm a slave to sin. Simply put. Well done, Paul. And he's been walking with the Lord a long time. 28, they say, 29 years. And it's still, his sin nature was still getting the best of him at times. Did he get him all the time? No, it might have been a stranger work. You know, we don't become sinless, but we start sinning less when we understand what God is doing in our lives. 
He saved me for a purpose, to build his kingdom. Guess what? This is his kingdom. You're in here. You're part of his kingdom. Amen. One body, many parts. Each one of us is just as important as me to God. To keep, you know, your body functions in perfect harmony, doesn't it? Yeah. All these parts of your body, without one piece of it, things start to malfunction. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with the body of Christ. When we're not all functioning and healthy together, the body doesn't function properly. Because not everybody really knows what they're here for. Can I get an amen, amen. for that? Amen. It's not just a few people. It's all the people that build the body. Think about all the parts of the body, outward and inward. Oh, I love everybody here. I do. Now, how do I know that we're talking about something here? I want us to go to Matthew 7, 13. I just want to give you a context so you really understand that he's yeah. talking about something in the spirit. Matthew 7? Yeah. Because everything I'm going to talk about is in the Bible, okay? And it's very simple what the Bible is trying to tell us. All we have to do is keep an open mind and understand what it's trying to say. In fact, that's not that hard. The Bible said to Jesus, that they said to Jesus, the common people heard him gladly. When you just take out your intellectual mind and just stay like a child, you understand everything in the Word of God. But when you try to figure out, when you try to put your human reasoning into the Bible, it doesn't fit. So you start to get confused. God is not the author of confusion. Guess who is? Satan. Satan, and he's the master of the flesh. So he wants to create confusion in the body instead of the simple word of God going into the believer's heart, renewing their mind, and changing their life ultimately. Because it doesn't change. Look, just because you get saved, the world doesn't change. Have you not noticed? As a matter of fact, it gets worse. The only thing that changes is your perception of it. You understand why you're here. And God has you and we're in a world of darkness. And he wants us to shine the light of Christ through us and put our flesh to death. Amen. And that's a slow, painful process. As we all know. Look what it says in verse Psalm 13 of Matthew 7. Because he's not talking about salvation from the penalty of sin. He's talking about salvation from the power of sin right here, Jesus. Look what he's saying. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell, okay, is broad and its gate is wide for the many who what? Choose that way. Now look what it says. But the gateway to life is very narrow. Now listen. There's a lot of people that are going to heaven. It's not that narrow. You believe in Jesus and you're going to heaven. And it says the road is difficult. No, it's not a contradiction. It, the road is not difficult to get to heaven. It's believe on the Lord Jesus, and heaven is your home. That's not difficult. It's simple. It's talking about the road that leads to life. Look what it says. But the gateway to life is very narrow, and the road is difficult, and only a few ever find it. How can it be? No, a lot of people found heaven. Talking about down here, people don't get to see that land the first. Remember he said in the Hebrews, I, I, so they don't, they never enter that place of rest. The nation of Israel was saved, but they never got into the promised land. But they went to heaven because they believed, right? But they failed to get into the promised land because of their unbelief, right? So there's what? There was, they believed in, the, in, in, in God could save them, but then they didn't believe that what? He could deliver them. He saved you, so heaven is your home. But you're getting delivered from the power of sin that still controls you, and that's why you can't have a testimony against the darkness. Because you're still living for yourself. You're not living for the Lord. You can't live for yourself and live for the Lord. He saved you from yourself, which is the problem to begin with. So if you get saved and keep living for yourself, it's going to be even worse than before. Because now you know the truth and you and you fail and you choose not to go down that road. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. So now we're going to talk about the journey, okay? Boy, is it a journey, huh? The nation Israel, you know, they've seen the power of God and the miracles, right? 
But as soon as it got a little difficult out in the wilderness, they wanted to go back to Egypt again because it was easier to be in slavery. A lot of Christians do the same thing. They get on the path that goes that leads the life to God, and they say, well, this Christian life is difficult. It's the only reason why it's difficult is because you're trying to do it with your own power. You're trying to live the Christian life through religion or willpower. And you can't. You have to live it by the power of the Spirit. Once that, it's not, it's not, it's not hard. God doesn't make it hard. He makes it easy for us. The problem is, the problem is me. I make it hard. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. amen. I can go out and I can blame, oh, I had a bad day. There was a lot of traffic. The people are just mean. And, and justify my behaviors. But really, that God sent me on a mission field. He saved me and he put them people in front of me to change me. Amen. I can't change them. They're there to, put, to change me so I can see it different and say, you know what? I'm going to pray for them. Amen. God, Jesus says to pray for your enemies. Can you do that in the flesh? Honestly. No, no, no. Well, you can pray that they get run over. <laughs> You know what I'm saying, right? But to sincerely pray for them, listen, the only thing that can overcome the sin nature is Jesus. So you pray that Jesus opens their eyes so they have a shot. Other than that, they have no shot. We can't save anybody because we can't even save ourselves. Amen. As long as you understand that the power is not in the flesh, the power is Jesus living through the flesh. Amen. All glory goes to who? Jesus. Amen. If it wasn't for Jesus, I wouldn't be here. Amen. If it wasn't for Jesus, I wouldn't be able to do anything. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If I try to live this Christian life out in the flesh, I am going to have the most miserable journey ever. I'm going to have that. <laughs> like I ate a solid pickle when I come to church. <laughs> that day. The devil was all over me. Let me tell you something. If the devil was all over you, that means you're doing something right. Amen. If the devil's not bothering you, you have to say you're just following him and he's not going to bother you. And Christians get into a little bit of pain. Oh, no, I can't. And they run. Look, I didn't have any power over my flesh before Jesus came. Now that Jesus came, I can, John can stay home now. You can stay home now. And God can live his life through you. Isn't that awesome? Think about that. Think of how mysterious that is. I can actually go out and deny myself, my flesh, and live for the kingdom of God. Because one life to live will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ the last. Whatever you do down here has no eternal benefits if it's not for Christ. It'll all get burnt up and you can't take it with you. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. All right. <laughs> what a journey it is, right? All right, so we understand that there's giants in the land. Now, we went over these giants last time we talked, right, about the seven giants, right? The Canaanites, which were merchants who humiliate. They were financial giants, okay? They thought that they could do everything without God, okay? It was a worldly type of thing, okay? The New Testament believer has to learn what God wants done in the area of finance, okay? God blesses other people with finance so they can, what, be a blessing to someone else, right? right? That's why a lot of Christians don't get blessed financially because God knows that they'll either be selfish with it or they will not, what? Support the kingdom with it. Amen. So they don't, so God, or take them away. God, remember in Proverbs it says, Lord, don't make me too rich where I walk away from you, or too poor where I have to steal. Just leave me right in the middle. So some people are blessed financially because they know how, they know that, look, God, all that money that you have, it's God's. And He knows. So what are the Canaanites? Financial. How about. How we can what? Can that can the Canaanite, can the worldly stuff take us away from God? Absolutely. Look at um, Proverbs 3, verse 9. Let's go there quick. We're not going to go into this too deep because we already did. It's already on there.
Proverbs or in verse, or chapter 3, verse 9. Now, it says in verse 9, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. Okay? Then you, he will fill your bonds with grain and your vats will overflow with good wine. So he's saying, trust me, right? And I'm going to take care of you. Very simple. Give God the best. Now, is that just money? No. Give God the very best of you when you serve him, when you come to church. Give him the very best of you. You, what, you leave your cares and stuff at the door, and you just what? Leave your mind open for him to fill it and renew it. Amen? The best of you. It's not always financial. It says, let your bodies become a living sacrifice to God. All right, look at Romans 13, verse 8, real quick. Romans 13, verse 8. Hit, um, Romans 13, verse 8, it says, Owe nothing to anyone except your obligation to love one another. What is the biggest thing that God wants you to do? Love. Look, I told you, the whole Bible is based on love God and love your neighbor as yourself. This whole book, if it was taken off you, that's all you'd have to remember. And you'd fulfill everything that was in it. Wow, oh, that's hard. I want deeper understanding. <coughs> no, that's all you really have to understand. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. The problem is we have a hard time loving ourselves because of our sin nature. Our sin nature makes us what? And that the devil keeps beating us up with the sin nature so we can't love others with their sin nature. Unless they show us their new nature, we don't love them. How about when they show their sin nature? Can you love them? Jesus loves me when I show my sin nature all the time. He's saying, go and do likewise. He says, John, I want you to love yourself. That was the hardest thing for me to do was forgive myself for all the stuff that I did in my life. That was the hardest thing I could do. I didn't want to forgive myself. I couldn't. And God said, no, that's a sin if you don't forgive yourself. Because if you can't forgive yourself, you can't forgive others. You cannot give somebody something you don't possess. If you don't possess forgiveness, you can't forgive. But you have to understand his forgiveness at the cross, right? He forgave us of everything. So he says, every time you want, that's why I call it holy amnesia. I said, Lord, please, let me just forget about what happened yesterday and remember the good stuff and not the bad. Mm -hmm. Jesus calls us to remember the good and let go of the bad. The devil wants us to remember the bad and let go of the good in someone so you can assassinate their character and drag them down. Can I get an amen for that? And how many of us keep score when somebody wrongs them? Can I get an amen for that? Amen. That's the flesh. Keeps no, 1 Corinthians 13, keeps no record of what? Being, Being wrong. wronged. <laughs> now, why would, the, why would the monetary take you out? Let's just go over this quick. Go to Matthew 13, because I want you to know how important this really is. Uh, Matthew chapter 13, yeah. It's talking about the farmer and the seed. The seed that fell among the door, in verse 22, represents those who hear God's word. Okay? People hear God's word, right? But all too quickly, the message is crowded out by what? The worries of this life and the lure of wealth. Now, what does it say there? So no fruit is produced. What is he talking about? What kind of fruit? Love, joy, peace, patience, self-control. You can't produce any of that fruit when the lure of wealth is taken over. Your lure of what? Heaven. Or worries. How many of us worry still? There's no peace when you're worried. When you are worried, that means you're not trusting what God is doing in your life. 
See, <clears throat> we're very, human beings are very like finite. We only see the moment. We don't see the whole picture that God's doing a work and in a season of our lives. So we always see the problem at hand. We don't see what he's going to teach us through it and the outcome of it. So we get all frustrated and we walk away from the Lord and we start trusting in what? The world again. Because we're not getting the result we want when we want it. So we begin to have what? Doubt and worry. Is God really working? Am I really saved? This doesn't, this, this does not look like what I expected it to be. Remember John the Baptist, you really think he was going to introduce Jesus? You really think he was going to get, end up in prison and get his head cut off? Remember he said, oh, go back and ask that Jesus, if he's really the one, should we look for someone else? Think about that. That's how discouragement and worry can set in. All right. Now I'm going to talk about the Hittites. It means terror or fear. What assurance of victory over fear, confusion, and discouragement do we have? Go to Joshua 1. How many of us don't serve God because of fear? Anybody that has anything to do with parts of ministry understands the fear you have to overcome to come up and do something for the Lord. Amen? And that could block a lot of Christians from serving the Lord. I thought you said one. Did you say Joshua 1? Yeah, Joshua 1. Look at verse 5. Now, this pertains to everybody. Look what it says in verse 5. He's telling Joshua. But guess what? He's not only telling Joshua, he's telling us, okay? <laughs> because when I start reading the Bible, God is speaking to us now, okay? The written word is the living word, okay? From Genesis to Revelation, God is speaking to us right now. He's saying, no one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. For I will be with you as I was with Moses. Now, was God with Moses? Yes, sir, he was. But guess what? He says, I'm going to be with you just like I was with him. Now, is that something that you're going to feel? Absolutely not. That's a fact that the Bible tells us that God is going to be with us anywhere. And it says, no one will be able to stand against you. But here's the thing. You have to trust what it's saying, and you have to obey what it's saying. This is when the power comes. For I will be with you. I will not fail you or abandon you. How many of us feel abandoned by God at times? Huh. Be honest. Why? Because you're trying to feel something. God is not a feeling. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will not fail you or abandon you. Is that a feeling? No, it's a fact. So when you can trust that fact, then you don't have to feel that. Listen, God is, you know what God's trying to do? He's trying to crucify your feelings and walk by faith. How many of us live off emotions, though? Honestly. Christians, it's all, it's all, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. We can all understand that we, oh, I don't feel like going to church tonight. I don't feel like doing this. I don't feel like going to work. I don't feel like doing this. I don't, does that, look, just because I don't feel like going to work doesn't mean I'm not going to. Just because I don't feel like going to church doesn't mean I'm not going to. I'm going to overcome my feelings and go by the facts. My power is way above your feelings, God's telling me. How many of us give into emotion, really? Powerful, right? The battle's up here. It's in the mind. Yeah. Look what it says. Be strong and courageous, for you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore the ancestors I would give them. Be strong and very courageous. Now listen what he's saying now. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Okay? Do not deviate from them turning either to the right or to the left, and then you will be successful in everything you do. What do we do? We deviate from what God says to do. Okay? It's just human nature. We deviate from it. But he says, but there's a list. There's always something attached to his promises. It says, don't deviate from it. So you will be successful. Look what it says. 
You will be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night, so you'll be sure to obey everything written in it. If you want to be able to obey this, that means you have to what? Read it, Read it day and night. If you're not reading it day and night, there's no way you can obey it. Because the power is in the word. Can I get an amen for that? And now, i got to be honest with you. Sometimes, like, I just don't want to go in the Bible. I don't want to go in there. How about you? There's been times when you're, like, frustrated with everything's out. I don't know. Just because I don't want it doesn't mean I'm not going to. See, this is the thing. Even though i got to pry this thing open, because this is not a natural event for human beings to open up the Bible for instructions. For, no, for human beings, it's the world for instructions. See, it's not natural for us. So that's why it's such a fight all the time. It's a fight to do good. Amen. But it says, meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. So when the word of God is circulating in your, in your mind, meditating, that's what it is, you're thinking about God's word, then you'll be able to what? Obey it, because it's always circulating in your mind. Your mind is now being renewed with what God is trying to say to you. So when the situations come up, God is circulating in your mind, and you don't start to get unstable. You stay stable. I'm trusting in this promise. He's never going to leave me nor forsake me. You already have all these things stored in here. This has to get, <laughs> this has to get in here. Remember he told Ezekiel, I want you to eat the scrolls. This has to become part of you. This written word has to become a living word. It has to be lived out through you. And the only way that's going to happen is if you have what? It's circulating in your mind all the time. Amen. And is that going to happen just by coming to church once a week? No, look, this is just a supplement. The real relationship with you and the Lord is when you're not here. That personal journey, when you don't want to get in the Bible and God wants to speak to you, when you say, oh, no, I'm just going to listen to someone else feed me God. And he said, no, it's time for you to eat yourself. How long is somebody going to feed you? That little baby Jeremiah, how, how mothers know, how long does it take before he eats on his own? About what? Five years? Three years? When, when does a kid start eating on his own? A couple of years, right? Well, how long do you going to come to church before you start eating, feeding yourself? Right? It's the same thing. Or else you'll never want. Crow. Can't get an amen for that. Amen. Come on, people, get live. Why not? The Word of God is awesome. When, you, when you're in the Spirit of God, right, that book is an awesome book to open up. Because you want to do the right thing. So the only way you're going to be able to do it is when you get in the air. Amen. And then you want to do the right thing. <laughs> oh, but God's not working fast enough in my life. I'm not going to help along. Yeah. Amen? Now look at this. Let's keep going now. Meditate on it day and night and be sure to obey everything written on it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in only all you do. See, there's a condition there. Only then. So that means what has to happen? I have to, I have to get this in me so I, it will work. It will not work any other way. It says only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do in this life. Spiritually. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Amen. Do you believe that tonight, my brothers and sisters? Do you believe he's with you wherever you go? Or at times where the places you are going, you don't want God to be with you? <laughs> yes. Are there places that you go that you want to leave Jesus home? It's very simple to let you know that you're doing the right thing. If you can take Jesus with you wherever you're going, then guess what? It's okay. When you don't want to take Jesus with you wherever you're going, guess what? It's definitely not God's will for you. Very simple barometer. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. 
Because I can't be with you 24 hours and you can't be in church 24 seven. The choices come down to you and you'll walk. When, when this becomes real to you, it's like Jesus is on the side of you. You better go make a decision, right? You keep looking over here. You know Jesus is right there. When it's that alive in you, you'll think twice about making the wrong choice. Because wherever you go, you take him with you. Can I get an amen for that? That's how alive it comes. That's the only thing that helps us overcome our flesh. You see? That's the only thing that'll work is the moment the truth comes when ain't nobody around. It's between you, your flesh, God, and the devil. And who's going to win at that point? If you don't have this stored here, the devil is going to win. And you're going to end up blaming God. Well, I'm going to church. I'm doing all these religious activities, but how come I can't win? Because all you're doing is religious outward things, and it's not going to fix what's going on inside you. Amen? Amen. The giant, this giant wants to conquer us and hinder us from process, possessing our promised land. By looking at God in his, in his word rather than at the problem we face, we are assured of victory. We cannot lose. The Bible says in Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon formed against me will prosper. And every tongue that rises against me in judgment, thou shalt condemn. For this is the heritage of the what? Servants of the Lord and their righteousness of, them, of me. You want the power of God? You have to decide to serve the living God. You can't get the power any other way. You can't get the power coming here, getting a message, then going to serve yourself. You get the power through serving him. Amen. And a lot of Christians don't get that. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. And then we get mad at God because, oh, why isn't it working? Oh, I'm getting, so this is so hard. This is too hard for me. I'm going to go back in the world because it's a lot easier to be in slavery to that than it is to what? Be in slavery to righteousness. You know what being a slave to righteousness is? Doing the right thing even when you want to do the wrong thing. A slave to sin is doing the wrong thing when you're supposed to do the right thing. A slave to righteousness, when Jesus comes into your life, you're like, you know, I really want to steal that. I want to steal it because it's in my nature. But I'm not going to do it. Get it? That's the slave of righteousness. And before you found Jesus, you just... <laughs> you can't do it anymore. Why? Because your conscience is heightened with God. Jesus is in there telling that little... Eh, no, don't do it. You know, the little, de the little simple analogy with the devil and the angel with the pitchfork, right? They're doing the costumes all the time. The devil's trying to pitchfork the angel off your shoulder. Well, guess what? When you've got Jesus, you can get the devil off your shoulder. Amen. Amen. You, can't have, you can't get that power any other way but through Christ. You don't need any other... Any, look, you don't need anything else. You do not... Let me say it again. You do not need anything else but this. You've got a library at home? This is all you need in it to be successful in life, if you believe it. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. What's the problem? We look to other resources to get it. When this is the ultimate resource for what's going on with me. It tells me why I'm depressed. It tells me why I'm possessed. It tells me what's wrong with me all the time. And it tells me how to do right. It's all in here. The question is, do you want truth? Do you really want the truth that will really truly set you free? Is the question. Or are we just, ah, I read my portion for today. And leave. Look, unless, listen, <laughs> I need this, I got to strap this to me. My sinful nature is so powerful and I'm so evil without this that I can deceive myself at any given time. If this isn't circulating in me, I'm failing. 
And I still do. I'm human. But I don't want to fail. Here's the thing. There's something in me now that doesn't want to do that anymore. Even though I do it, I hate it. I hate my sin nature. This book has taught me how to hate my sin nature and not love it anymore. I hate my sin nature when it comes out. It's ugly. Mm -hmm. It's not if it comes out, it's when it comes out. Yep. But guess what? It's starting to come out less and less because I'm trusting this more and more. Amen. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. But if you don't trust this more and more, guess what? Your sin nature will come out more and more. And this will come out less and less because you don't believe it or trust it. And you have to ask yourself, do I really trust it? Because I'm really still trying to operate out of my flesh, and that's why I'm so miserable. Yeah. Instead of letting God, look, God takes his time. We live in a what? Instant society, right? Yeah. I want God to change me now. He did. Your position before God has already changed forever. You are going to heaven. That's changed. Thank God for that. If nothing else ever comes of it, heaven is your home. But who would just want to just listen? Who wants to live? Look, once you have, it says in the Bible, right? Once you have this, and then you go back into the world again, you're worse off than before. It was better that you not know this than to know it and then go back into sin again. Because now you have no excuse. See, one thing that we are as Christians is accountable to what God teaches us. Because you can't claim ignorance is bliss anymore. You are no longer ignorant to what God wants for you. That's why you get so miserable as a Christian, because you know the truth, and you're, and you're rebelling against what it says. Yeah. And you're abusing what God's given you to just justify your sins. And it makes you miserable. It doesn't hurt God, it hurts you. Living in sin kills you. He's, Jesus said to him, he said, what is sin in your mouth? He said, go and sin no more. He said, stop sinning or something worse is going to happen to you. Listen, you can sin all you want, but don't think that there's no consequences to it because you're a Christian. There's more. There's more consequences to sin because now you are accountable for it. You can't say, I didn't know. Because now it's an ultimate act of rebellion. So you can go sin all you want. I said, I'll tell you what, i got a healthy fear of God. If you read the Old Testament, see what he can do? Hmm. <laughs> what did he do? He said, I'm sending an evil spirit into Saul. God can put evil spirit. He can let the devil have at you all he wants. Please. No. I don't want the devil to have at me. I want Jesus to be at me. Look, the, the, the reason why God lets the devil have at us it's because we're not being obedient. When you're obedient, you're always walking with the Lord. He's saying, look, I, I don't want the, I don't want to have to chasten you by using the devil in your life. I want to what? Chasing you by the eye. The word of God is what corrects you. You say, oh, you know what? I'm not going there. I want to lead you by the eye, not the bit or the bridle, right? When they want to make a horse turn, they, they put pain into it, right? God doesn't want to change you with pain. He wants to change you with the love of his words. Amen. But he will do what he has to do to change you. Once you're his kid, you can't get out of the family. It's like the mafia. Once you're in, you're in. You can't get out. God. And you want to thank God for that. You can't get out. Then we got the Hivites, living a, uh, the good life by living their lifestyle. Many alternate philosophies and religions today offer to give their adherents life. The enemy loves to lure people into lifestyles, claiming to be the answer to that person's needs and desires. Well, if you just had this, if you just lived this, you know, lifestyles of the rich and famous, if you just had all this, everything will be good in your life. And then you say to yourself, well, you know what? I look at all these people that have all that stuff, and I really don't see a good life from it. The movie stars and all people with millions of dollars, they don't, they're not happy. As a matter of fact, they're doing worse than people that don't have that. <laughs> so why would I go after that? It's only going to take me away from God. Why do I want to be rich and famous? The Bible says you're better off being poor and spiritual than rich and famous in this world. Can 
Amen. Amen. Then there's what? The parasites, where people who have been separated and live unprotected, unwalled villages. The enemy loves to separate us from God and thus our protection. You see, that's why he says not to, see, when we're together like this, it what? Strengthens us. Amen. That's why he says not to what? Forsake the assembly. Because when you're out on your own, living your own life, look, God tells us what we have to do. Not to forsake the assembly. Why? Because just like when um, a lion is hunting out in the wilderness, right? What does he see out there? Like a deer that's straggling in the back? He doesn't go after the one that's in the middle of the pack. He goes after the one lagging behind. And that's how the devil gets us. We lose all our spiritual strength by not gathering and plugging in. That's one way. And what's the other way? How does the, how does the, how does the enemy lure us away from God's protection? Go to James 1. We're already out of time. <coughs> I'm going to close with this, though. How does he lure us away from God's protection? James 1, look at verse 14. I'm going to close with this scripture. How does he lure us away? Temptation. Okay? Whatever you sold out to the devil, listen to me. This is important. I want you to grasp this. Whatever part of your soul you sold out to the devil... There's always an opportunity for him to come and tempt you with it because you already sold out. That's why God said make sure you destroy all that and never go back to it because once you go back to it, you're always gonna be, it's going to be harder and harder to get away from it. Now look what he says. Temptation comes from our own desires. Okay? Everybody blames the devil. Listen, we, we desire things that are not godly. Well, it comes from all, which what do they do? They entice us and drag us away. Listen to what I'm saying to you now. These desires give birth to what? Sinful actions. And look what it says. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. So once the, you know when a sin gets planted in your head and you want to do something? Uh, no, you get tempted, right? Now listen to what I'm saying now. Listen up now. You get tempted. The thought comes in your head. You don't know where it comes from. That's how you know there's a, another realm that we can't see. All of a sudden, you get a temptation to do something you know that's not of God. And what happens? You start romancing it. You start thinking about it again and again. If you don't change the channel right away, it starts to what? It starts to fester and starts conceiving. Just like it, it start, now, now it's in your mind. And it's starting to stay in there now. You're not doing it, but you're thinking about it. Right? And eventually, the devil's really very patient with everybody. He lets you keep thinking about it, thinking about it, thinking about it, until what? It finally gives birth to an action. What's the, what's the solution? Once that temptation comes, to what? Change the channel right away. You already know that if you let it fest up, it's going to give birth to an action, so you better get rid of it now, or else it's going to give birth. None, none of us are strong enough. It tells us to run from that. Can I get an amen for that? Now, how do you do that? See, Lord, please. No, the, the devil, can you see the devil? No. Listen, how do I know this? I'm praying, right? Now, listen, I, I'm not perfect, right? I, I try to pray, and I'll be on my knees praying to God, right? And this awful thing will come into my mind. The most vile, vulgar, evil thing comes into my mind right when I'm talking to Jesus. And I'm saying, where did that come from? Because I wouldn't have let that in if I could see it. It's an invisible enemy. It's a predator that you can't see. Right? Does anybody go through that or is it just me? If there was ADHD, I got it in my prayer life. I start to forget what I was praying about. And the world starts coming in. Like, what am I going to do today? And all of a sudden, I'm like, where's God ain't even there anymore? Get it? That's how much we have to refocus and say, no, 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 no. Satan, get behind me. Yep. Yeah. Satan, get behind me. It's my time with God. Yeah. You have to fight for this. It's forcefully advanced. The kingdom of God is forcefully advanced. i got to force this into me. It's not natural for us. 
That's why it's okay to fight. Listen, that's why I'm saying this to you. So you know, when you have that struggle, you don't say there's going to be something wrong with me. Why are these things coming into my head while I'm praying? When everybody says, well, I prayed for two hours straight. Everything was so good. It's like, really? I'm trying to get five minutes in and half of it's back. And that's the reality of it. That's right. Right? We can be real, right? That's why we want to keep church real. And understand that we're trying to heal from something that we can't heal from in ourselves. Yeah, and we can't hide it. Why cover it up? When you cover something up, it only grows inside of you. Yeah, but when you reveal it, look, man, I'm struggling with my prayer life. And then I'll drag my wife in there and say, Lord, pray with me. Help me. Look, we have each other to help each other. Say, look, I'm weak in this. I, I have a hard time praying. Can you help me? Yeah, let's go pray. Let's go focus. Let's Look, if we can't... Look, God gives us the body so we can fix, help fix each other. Yeah. Instead of hiding it, what do people come to church? Shh, don't let anybody know what's going on. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's a lot going on. I'm mad at God. I can't pray. I don't want to pray. I don't want to open my Bible. Okay, brother, I'm, I feel the same way. Let's go pray about that, man. Let's go, let's go fight this. Amen. And then you get the strength from the body to help you. <coughs> How are you going to get help if you don't tell anybody you need it? And then we get mad and say, oh, nobody's talking to me or helping me. No, because they can't read your mind. Amen. Nobody knows what we're going through. And the devil wants to keep us mouth shut and act like everything's going on and play church and never get anything accomplished in our spiritual life. Amen? Amen. All right, we're going to close there. Thank you for the share. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.